Hi, in this video I want to give a brief rundown on how the Atari VCS, the Atari 2600's graphics work. There's some beauty in their simplicity, and with some understanding of the hardware, the programming achievements made on the system become truly impressive. The Atari was designed to play two games as cheaply as possible, Pong, which became Video Olympics, and Tank, which became Combat. They envisaged the system would be around for a few years, but would reasonably quickly be replaced by the next system, as had happened with the first generation of consoles. Looking at these games, we can identify the elements needed to create them. We need a screen colour. We need a playfield for boundaries in Pong and obstacles in combat. We need two player objects, or sprites as they would later be called. We need two missile objects. The missiles are just a pixel or a line. Simple bit sprites, on or off. The Atari also had a third sprite to represent the ball for Pong. Not sure why a missile sprite couldn't be used, but thankfully they included it because all of these objects would be used and needed in many games. Because memory was expensive, the Atari was designed to minimise the amount of RAM on board. Computers have what is known as a frame buffer. It is a portion of random access memory that contains a bitmap that drives the video display. The graphics circuitry converts an in-memory bitmap into a video signal that can be displayed on a computer monitor. For example, the Fairchild Channel F, the very first proper game console with interchangeable games and a CPU, had 2 kilobytes of RAM to store its 128 by 164 by 2 bits, 4 colours, graphics. The Atari has a resolution of 160 by 192 or 228 in power regions, with 128 possible colours. It somehow manages to have all these objects' colours with a much higher resolution than the Fairchild, with only 128 bytes, that's bytes not kilobytes, of RAM. How does it do this? Well, the Atari has no frame buffer. Today we're moving into 3D ray traced graphics. The Atari's graphics, on the other hand, are essentially one dimensional. It only stores one memory line of graphics at a time and reallocates that memory every scan line of the screen, and all this is handled by the CPU. The old school CRT televisions that the Atari was designed for work by having three electron beams scanning from left to right, top to bottom to create the image that you would see. The Atari could synchronise itself with the horizontal scan and the vertical scan, so the programmers could know when the beam had finished a line and when it had finished a screen. To track where it was at any given time, they would have to be aware of each CPU instruction that they had programmed and how long it would take. When the scanning beams were in the correct position to draw a graphic, they would instruct the CPU to send the appropriate image. No X and Y positions, just counting out processor cycles and timing when items should be drawn. In debug mode in Stellar we can see all these graphical elements with colour information ignored, so they are always the same colour. The screen colour is grey, the playfield is purple, the player objects are red and yellow, the missiles are orange and green, and the ball sprite is blue. So looking back at these game elements we have our screen colour, our playing field, you'll notice the playfield is quite chunky. It actually consists of 24 pixel tiles that only cover half the field. The second half of the screen most commonly mirrors the first half of the screen like you see in combat, but it also could repeat it. If you wanted to change the right side from the left, you would have to time writing the memory address in between drawing the left and starting to draw the same memory address on the right. In debug, we can see the three memory addresses as different shades of purple. The first is a 4-bit address, which is why it's smaller, and the second two are 8-bit, making up the 24 pixel blocks. In combat, the score is created using the playfield. So the first score is put in the memory address, and after it is drawn, the memory address would have to be rewritten mid-scan line to allow for the different scores. The player sprites are each one byte, so eight pixels of one color, either on or off. In between each scan line, the sprite is changed to make a two-dimensional shape from what really is a one-dimensional sprite. But wait a second, the Atari had Space Invaders. It could display more than two sprites. The player sprites could be repeated in the same scan line, a technique called multiplexing, and stretched and they could be reallocated as you move down the screen. The colour could also be changed, meaning that each line could be a different colour. If we look at Space Invaders, you can see the invading aliens are actually the two player sprites alternating and repeating. Then the sprites are reallocated to be the shields, and then reallocated to be the player. You're pretty much shooting yourself, thus providing a thoughtful commentary on the tragedy and senselessness of war. Yes, they are squid monsters from space, but aren't we all basically squid monsters from space? Space Invaders is extra clever in that it would change the sprite in between aliens to allow them to explode, thus allowing for more than two different player objects on the screen in the same scan line without flickering. And don't get me started on the shields, quite a programming achievement. 
One of my favourite games, Battlezone, shows how these simple elements could be used to create graphics way beyond what the system was designed for. The radar screen is made up of a mirrored player sprite, the second player sprite being the scan line, and a ball and missile sprite for the radar blips. The mountains are made up of playfield graphics, the player sprites, the missile sprites, and the screen colour. The lines on the ground are created by changing the screen colour in between scan lines. The enemies are player sprites with colour changes in between scan lines to add detail. You'll notice that the player sprite being used with it which enemy is swapped on the fly. The player tank is an enormous graphic for the Atari. His tracks are the player sprites, the turret and missile sprites, the chassis of the tank is created using the playfield graphics and changing the colour of the screen in between the tracks to colour in the front outline, back of the turret and the hatch. While the Atari graphics are beyond basic by today's standards, there's some beauty in the programming trickery that went into making even the simplest games on the system. While most of the games are difficult to go back to now, it is a system cemented into gaming history, and there are a few gems on the Atari that will always be good games, and have managed to squeeze some magic out of the little system that could. Thank you very much for listening.